Hello everyone to this week's episode of Interesting History. Today we're going to be taking a look at something called the Kindermot, or the Massacre of the Innocents. I want to also thank all of you guys that have subscribed since last video, and uh, without further ado, let's get right into it. The First Battle of Ypres was a culmination of the first year of the Great War. After four months of heavy casualties, 750,000 for the Germans and 905,000 for the French, the German army attempted one last breakthrough to win a decisive victory, as well as the war. After the Battle of the Frontiers, the Entente were in full retreat back towards Paris, France. General Falkenheim, now the Chief of Staff of the German army, laid plans to get to Paris and win the war before Christmas. He had one problem, though. This war had already caused so much destruction to the German manpower pool that they had called up at the beginning of the war. Falkenhayn would call on the reservists to complete this decisive battle. The number of reservists is now hotly contested among World War I historians. More recently, a historian by the name of Jay Sheldon believed that 30% of the casualties at Ypres were from the subject of today's show. The rest were part of the Landwehr also the older portion of the German army. The 30% of the casualties for the German side at the First Battle of Ypres were student volunteers, and the battle would become known as the Kindermord, or the Murder of the Innocents. After the war was declared in 1914, the German youth movement did not hesitate in embracing the Fatherland's entry to the conflict. This was a time in history when war was idealized and the struggle and battle an organic need. I wanted to provide an example shown through cinema, first in the 1930s and then remade in color into the 1970s, also a book called All Quiet on the Western Front. Some of you may have ambitions, 
I know of one young man who has great promise as a writer, and he has written the first act of a tragedy which would be a credit to one of the masters. And he is dreaming, I suppose, of following in the footsteps of Goethe and Schiller, and I hope he will. But now, our country calls. The fatherland needs leaders. Personal ambition must be thrown aside in the one great sacrifice for our country. Here is a glorious beginning for your lives. The field of honor calls you. Why are we here? You, Crop, what has kept you back? You, Mother, you know how much you are needed? Ah, I see you look at your leader. And I, too, look to you, Paul Baumer. I wonder what you are going to do. I'll go. I want to go. Count on me. Me too. I'm ready. I'm not going to stay home. Dozens of German university and college students volunteered enthusiastically for the army. They joined with their fraternity and classmates. Instead of dividing the students, almost all the volunteers went to make up for the numbers of the quickly reformed 4th Army. They received minimal training and were sent to battle in just seven weeks. There, they were led by elderly officers who did not have any idea of the killing power of modern machine guns and artillery. The 4th Army's medal would be tested on November 10th, 1914, and unfortunately for them, it was against what was left of the British professional army. The university students would be slaughtered. I want to read you a letter uh, by a 21-year-old named Herman Koopman, wrote to his family as he laid on the battlefield waiting to die from a mortal wound. Quote, My dearest parents, myself too, I must die the most beautiful death. These are my last regards. Farewell, and do not weep. I am eternally grateful for all the good I have received from you. Farewell eternally. I will see you in heaven. Your Herman. End quote. The German army released a telegraph that recounted the university student's experience. On the Eve sector of the front, we made good progress yesterday. We stormed Dixmuden, approximately 500 prisoners of war and nine machine guns. Further south, our troops forced their way over the canal. To the west of Langmark, our young regiments attack, singing Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, while advancing against the enemy lines and taking them. I want to read you something very similar that was written after the war by someone that we all know. Quote, and then followed a damp, cold night in Flanders. We marched in silence throughout the night, and as the morning sun came through the mist, an iron greeting suddenly burst above our heads. Shrapnel exploded in our midst and spluttered in the damp ground. But before the smoke of the explosion disappeared, a wild hurrah was shouted from two hundred throats in response to this first greeting of death. Then began the whistling of bullets and the booming of cannons, the shouting and sighing of combatants. With eyes straining feverishly, we pressed forward, quicker and quicker, until we finally came cl to close quarter fighting, there beyond the beet fields and meadows. Soon the strains of a song reached us from afar. Nearer and nearer, from company to company it came, and while death began to make havoc in our lengths, we pressed to the song on those beside us, Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, über alles und der Welt. It is these sorts of statements that make me wonder whether someone in my generation will go to war with such a fervor. I know that I wouldn't. These boys were a source of patriotism for the political parties after the war. Was it necessary for these patriotic boys to die? The same man from the previous quote asks whether it was all in vain. Now all had been in vain, in vain all the sacrifices and deprivations, in vain the hunger and thirsts of endless months, 
In vain the hours during which gripped by the fear of death, we nevertheless did our duty, and in vain the death of two million who died thereby. Would not the graves of all the hundreds of thousands open up, the grave of those who once had marched out with faith in the fatherland, never to return? Would they not open up and send the silent heroes, covered with mud and blood, home as spirits of revenge, to the country that had so mockingly cheated them of the high sacrifice which in this world man is able to bring to his people? Was it for this that they had died, these soldiers of August and September 1914? Was it for this that the regiments of volunteers followed the old comrades in the fall of the same year? Was it for this that the boys of seventeen sank into Flanders Field? Was that the meaning of the sacrifice which the German mother brought to the fatherland when in those days, with an aching heart, she let her most beloved boys go away, never to see them again? Was it all for this that a handful of miserable criminals were allowed to lay hand on the fatherland? End quote. Even if the numbers are exaggerated, today the Kindermord is remembered as young men making the ultimate sacrifice for the country. It also reminds us how dangerous war and propaganda can be. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you did enjoy. If you're new to the channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button up above. I try to cover a range of historically based topics, whether it be historical books, events, people, top tens, what ifs. They're all going to be coming to the channel in once a week videos. So thank you guys very much again for watching, and hopefully I can talk to you next time.